Casey Wong and Jed from the Kakoli Group. And today we're going to discuss their investor journey. We started in 2003. When we started in 2003, we were just getting into the real estate uh, investing journey and it was completely different from now. And that time financing was so easy. Like if you could breathe, you had like a pulse, they almost gave it to you. Real estate always changes and you're always trying to look for that deal. Back then it was very, very simple that anybody can almost get a mortgage. Real estate is, it can be as boring as you can get or as creative as you can, as you can get within the bigger confine, of course. You got to think about what else can you do with this property? All righty, everybody, welcome back to the Canadian Real Estate Channel. I'm Adam J.D. Martin, and I know you guys didn't come here for me. You came here for Casey Wong and Jed from the Kikoli Group, and that's what we're bringing you today. We have got both of them here, and today we're going to discuss their investor journey and how we really see investing as a whole in real estate changing from the last you know, 10, 20 years last five years and what we're seeing right now in terms of market conditions, how we're feeling about where the market's at and what, and what's just changed. Like what's the lending situation? Like what's the assets like, what are the tenants like today? Uh, we're not going to dive too deep into their tenants cause I know that can get us all into trouble, but we are going to explore just a little bit about how things have changed. So welcome to the channel guys. Welcome back with a warm welcome from all of the fans. I know I'm excited to have this discussion. Would you mind giving us a little introduction and telling us where you started, where you're at today, and what's changed? Sure. So we started in 2003. When we started in 2003, we were just getting into the real estate uh, investing journey, and it was completely different from now. So everything really changes. So let's step back in time. 2003, uh, we, we actually looked at condos, the market, and we were comparing condos, single family homes, the triplexes, duplexes, triplex in the downtown sort of Toronto area along the corridor of Young Street, uh, condos and comparing to all these, you know, smaller uh, uh, duplex and triplexes. So back then, let me give you like sort of a price range. We bought it for 197,500. It was cheap. We only needed at that time, probably uh, just even 10% down, but I put down 25%. 2003 triplex. Uh, and let me give you a snippet. So I'm going to go really, really quick. Then in 2004, um, we bought a 10 plex. Uh, in Kitchener, it was a tenplex at four hundred thirty thousand, so forty three thousand dollars per unit in Kitchener, downtown Kitchener. And you guys had that old video. Um, in uh, it was a, a snowy day, garbage truck was going, and that was a tenplex at forty three thousand. So let's fast forward a little bit more. London, I know you guys are in the London market. We bought it at Wonderland and Sarnia, so we're hitting the student market. Student market, uh, great, you know, great income, uh, higher, uh, higher rental. Uh, because of the students and we bought it for wonderland and sarnia 1437 wonderland road and we bought that for 98,500. and that time financing was so easy like if you could breathe you had like a pulse they almost gave it to you and we bought it for 98 9 down payment okay um and why am i getting at all these so i don't have to go through all of the the transactions that we've done but real estate always changes and you're always trying to look for that deal Back then, it was very, very simple that anybody can almost get a mortgage. They were looking at um, us as, as people that will take out the mortgage, not even looking at sometimes the, uh, the rental income. Uh, well, so I mean, I mean when, we were, when we first started out, the type of assets also different as well, right? So we're yeah, not true. looking at uh, big multifamily. So we were looking at single townhomes, uh, it could be a duplex or it could be a triplex or duplex. Those ones are essentially looking at you, not yeah. necessarily the, pro the, the property itself. Um, but at a certain point, and I'm sure everybody knows that you hit the wall, right? You hit the ceiling and you realize, uh oh, you own all these properties, but the bank sees you as a liability. So yeah. what happens then? Um, everybody's asking for that, asking, asking that questions. Um, so for us, what I saw was, okay, you, it's great to have all these little ones, but at some point you have to consolidate them. Um, and then you, because we bought this 10 plex back in 20, uh, 2004, that was our first take 
at least from my perspective, my first take uh, into multifamily Multi financing, right? Yes. So there was a, a huge learning curve, but but at the time, Tenplex was a little was big for us. Um, so fast forward, I think I think everything kind of stall. Like there's a frenzy. There's a, everyone's going for um, Hamilton Market. Everyone was going for Barry Market. Um, that was during the time was 2006, 2006, 7, um, all the way up to eight, right? Then it, everybody, and you remember, right? There's a Great Depression, but in Canada, we didn't get hit as hard. However, we still we still got hit. That's a financial crisis in 2007, eight, and nine ish, and then uh, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, and so on, so forth. Yeah, yeah. So so here, back in like going back home here, we saw a lot of the people who were buying a lot of, you know, homes, um, smaller, not, not necessarily like huge multifamily, smaller homes, they went, they, they just got burned, right? We, we kind of, we kind of got burned a little bit, um, but not because of over leveraging is because there, there's some mistakes we made in Hamilton where we kind of burn ourselves. But at the end of the day, we were able to recover. Um, and then we saw, you know, the market kind of went back to more moderate pace. People are a little bit more cautious because a lot of the more aggressive investors, they, oh, they're, they're burned and they have to hide out. And so, so at the end of the day, um, we went back in, we started to look at opportunities uh, back in 2013. Then we, you know, we went for strictly performance, right? No hype, just performance. Yeah. Um, even the bank also were a very were very conservative as well. That kind of, you know, you hate it when the bank doesn't give you a lot of money, but you actually they're doing you a favor. They're doing you a service. That you're not over leveraged. Exactly. You, they force you to not to over leverage, so they force you to figure out how you can put in more equity, and that's that's starting to kind of pace uh, help us some background understanding of okay how does the lend, how does the lend what does the lender think about when they look at our application right you have to make sure your mindset is in their in their head you need to know what they're thinking in order for you to prepare your package as favorably as possible um but but i gotta say the we we continue to look for opportunities also have to raise capital as well so that was a turning point, right? 20, 2014 is when we started Kakoli, really formalized what we had done in the prior 10, 10 plus years. Um, so let me interject is that when, even from 2003, when we were building our portfolio, we did it ourselves. And then people saw this, our investors saw this, or people basically said that, okay, well, how do you get involved? And then boom, they started sort of coming in at different times. And they can see our journey. And that's what people want to see. They want to see our experience, what we have done, what mistakes that we have made, uh, and how we learn from it, how we pivot. But, but more so is we actually have gathered all <coughs> these experience and apply it in our in Kakoli way of yep. um, you know, assessing opportunities, making sure we're not overly leveraged, making sure that if you know, if trouble do, when, when troubles come and they do come, <laughs> when they come, how do we react? Do we react or pro, do we proactively attack, uh, attack it? So because of all these different, um, from the 2003, all the way got burned, you know, rose up again and we calibrate the whole strategy, we were able to bring that knowledge and experience in how we work here in Kakoli. And I think in 2014, that's when, that's when we started a uh, formalized this whole real estate uh, management firm. Uh, and then since then, we saw the, the mom and pop run apartment buildings, you know, in between uh, 20 units all the way up to like 60 units, let's say. Um, the opportunity we saw was huge. And the dollar, like the amount of money that we need to buy those properties were very reasonable. Obviously, as a buyer, you always want something cheaper. But we learned, our, we learned the lesson that never buy something just because it's cheap. Yeah. So you buy something because it's got <laughs> value. And even if you have to pay the market price, you know the value is there that you know how to extract. 
it's still a good deal. And I remember you buy, you make money when you buy. I never really understood it in the early days, but over time, you kind of wonder, you kind of know and experience that 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 wisdom. You buy, you make money when you buy. So you don't buy excessively high, pay excessively high price. And then you know how to extract these little nuggets here and there from the, in the from the property. Throughout in 2014, 15, <coughs> 16, even 17, it's still pretty, um, I would say, reasonable. The purchase price is still reasonable comparing to the upside on what we see the upside in the building. Starting uh, starting after 17, we start to see, you know, there's a lot more people coming into our space. There's a there's a, a bit of a bidding war. There's a, it's a bit of a um, expectation from the buy from the seller to sell at a, a little bit more premium. For some, we're willing to pay for it, but most of the time, we we're not willing to pay for it. Maybe it was a bad mistake. Um, however, we felt it's safer. Uh, at the end of the day, we're not here to speculate. We're here to make money, like with solid opportunities and, and not overpay too much. So I think that's a good opportunity for you guys now because you, you used a couple words there that I think it would be useful to define from your perspective. So uh, one of the first words you said was performance, right? So what in the spirit of not speculating and in the spirit of making good calculated risks, right? Because we're always we're always facing risk in any market or investment in the spirit of making good risk and taking on good risk, what does performance mean to you? And, and I'll just preface this too with two other words I'd like you to touch on. You've mentioned performance, upside, and value. So I would love to kind of hear from your perspective on performance, upside, and value over the last few years. Like what's different today? And how are we, how are we targeting these three things that you're focusing on? So performance within that class, let's say, um, I'll give a context is that we just purchased a 29 unit building in Kitchener. It's a townhouse complex. So performance is this, is that are you able to outperform the rest of the 29 unit complex within that category? Uh, yes or no. Uh, what's different from this 29 units? It's a townhouse complex. Can we sell it? Can we kind of minimize it? Is there upside on rents? Is there a, a sale price that we can sell when we kind of minimize it? What's that? bottom dollar, right? So it's a tick for each and every one of those. So performance, yes. Upside and performance is the same thing in a way that my upside is on my rent, one, one fold, two fold is the uh, market price per unit now, okay? I bought it as a whole, I'm gonna divvy it up individually. So that too is, 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 is another check mark. Going back to the upside, mm -hmm. when we underwrite a deal, uh, we always look at What's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario, if, if it has to be a buy and hold, how, what's the rent increase it has to be or expense decrease it has to be in order to make it worthwhile investment? What is the, what to us, what is the rate of return that cons is considered as um, acceptable? So all of these are, all these parameters has to be set out from the get go and then we stick with it. Um, when you, when the upside is, okay, I see this building to have energy efficiency um, uh, opportunities for us to, to capitalize on. So let's go at it. And what does that mean to the bottom line? So these are the upside. Or the rent. You know, the rent today is this. Let's say we're going to allocate about 10% vacancy rate um, to a higher, to the market, to the market price. Does that make sense for us? Or does it have to be 20% vacant, 20% turnover, turnover? What is, what happens if it doesn't turn over as fast as what we would like? Or the, it, these are all sensitivity analysis. Um, as we became a little bit more sophisticated throughout this whole journey, we incorporate all those in our underwriting with all the properties that we, um, you know, that we, that we handle, that we organize. So, so again, is it only the one exit strategy, right? And I think one thing I like about this, um, what we're doing is that real estate is, 
it can be as boring as you can get or as creative as you can as you can get within the bigger confine of, of course um, like I'm not changing a multifamily typical you know three-story walk up into a hotel like that's just you know financially it just doesn't make sense but within it like you gotta think about what else can you do with this property some of the big you know uh, if it's too out of the box uh, I may not want to take on that risk but little improvement here and there can make a huge difference when we multiply with the multiplier, right? So when you talk about the upside performance um, and, 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 and the value, those are the things that we look at and how within our team, um, how can we maximize that, that, that value? If there's a certain area that we know we don't have, then find it, find, either a partner or someone, a third party that will help us execute that time. That, that's an interesting um, little path to go down as well. Like, yeah, I know in my business, I've, I've taken a lot of time and energy and almost like a singular focus on standardization, process oriented, um, almost uh, like looking for Kaizen type of uh, production, right? Where everything is done by a specialist we're maximizing our efficiency on every different task so that each role is highly specialized on a small portion of the process. So for you guys, like you just mentioned, maybe if you don't have a skill or don't have that uh, thing available to you or that tool available to you, you would seek a partner. Um, but what sort of role has standardization or specialization played in your investing strategy? Or have you guys really explored a lot of different things. And that's sort of what makes you guys have a competitive advantage. Like, are you more the generalist or more the specialist in terms of real estate strategy? Because you mentioned condos there, you know, we've got long term buy and holds, potential flips, whatever, like, are you guys generalists or specialists for in terms of upside? i like to say that we're specialists. You, ha you have to be very honed to your skill, your niche is very small. So I don't look at anything else but real estate, but multifamily, and that's it. And just managing it, being able to hold it for the long term. Jed is the same way. She's a specialist. And that's what makes you good at something. Like if you take a thousand slap shots, you're going to get very good at it, right? Uh, just like that Bruce Lee saying is that yeah, the man kick. that goes a thousand kicks, I'm not afraid of, but a guy who, who has kicked a thousand times, I'm afraid of that guy. So you have to specialize. You really need to know what you're going into and you got to do it for the long term because in real estate, people get out so quick. They, they don't stay for the long haul and the long haul, which I'm saying 20, 30, 40 years is a long haul. And that's where you reap the major, major benefits. But I, but I would say with a caveat to the specialization, I'm specializing in um, multifamily. But even within a multifamily, you can't just be fixated on, I'm only doing buy and hold, right? Oh, I'm only buying this type of building in this location with this type of tenant profile. Like, yeah. then you become very rigid. What I mean is you, you find something that you really, um, let's say in our case, multifamily. But within it, you have high-end rental, you have me. me like, you know, middle income rental, you have secondary market, you have primary market, and what can you afford? And who are you competing with? Are you just buying like a, a like buy existing, just not no upside, but but really could save? Or are you buying something like what we have done, the value add type of building, where you really roll up your sleeves and, and you know, put in mm -hmm. some, some sweat equity in there? Or we have done condo conversion, where we bought you know, a 36 unit uh, condo, condo grade rental building, one building, and then we chop it up. We did that um, and it was, it was crazy. We never thought we would do something like that, but we saw the opportunity. So it's still multifamily, but it's not multifamily buy and hold. So you have to be a bit of, you need to be creative in a way. Uh, look at the opportunity, you gotta look at different ups, different, different um, possibilities. And what's the worst, what's the most, um, What's the basic, the, 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 the basis of this asset? And then how do you make money if you turn around, if you do something else? Yeah. So now we're getting into the discussion of value, which was the third word I'd like to really unpack. And um, I, I guess just touching on this too, like when is it appropriate to change the asset mix that you have, right? Because you're going to 
like if we look at a, a much smaller case in myself, we don't have to go through all 300 of your units or 300 plus, right? If we look at myself, like I bought a really terrible building in a horrible neighborhood because I could afford it. And that was like my first, right? My first multifamily. Um, now, there, there's this really big disconnect in general, I think, with a lot of people and, and probably people watching this video right now between price and value, right? And so I, I'd love to unpack that with you guys. Like, what is the difference between price and value? And when do we know when to start changing our asset mix to be more reflective of our long-term goals? Because one thing I would say is buying that terrible building in the terrible neighborhood was actually a really valuable step for me to do, even though... Um, financially, it potentially was a horrible idea, right? I, I broke even on the project, but I gained a tremendous amount of skills. Um, and, and I also learned that I would never do that project again. And so perhaps <laughs> that was the biggest value I could extract. Um, but, but walk me through that. Like, obviously, in your journey, you know, you've talked about a 10 plex, and I'm sure now maybe a 10 plex for you isn't as exciting as it once was. So at what point do you think you move on from that general, general speaking, I bought a building. Now I got good at that strategy or I buy several of these buildings. Now I'm ready to move on to maybe a bigger asset or expanding my horizons inside multifamily. Okay. Let's step back a bit. I, I think that price and value, I'd like to, you know, sort of start my story when you said that you just bought the worst building in the worst <laughs> location. When we bought ours and we learned our lesson, I told you about Hamilton, uh, <laughs> Main Street Engage, that when we buy the, the worst property in the worst location, you look back and you, you'll, you'll think and say that I got a great deal. But in hindsight, it's actually very difficult for you to change it. It's hard for you to change that area. It's hard for you to maneuver that building, stabilize that building and get it to that value that you want it to be. That I have to say is very difficult. Short so, of buying all the buildings. This was my problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you can't buy the entire street and change it. You can't it. buy it all. Yeah. So my, my going back is the value, you're, you can buy market value. You, you can hopefully buy something under value on a good street, on a B class, not necessarily a D class, maybe a C or a B, and then basically change it because you're not going to change a neighborhood. So that's, that's, that was my learning lesson. That's probably your lear learning lesson too. So buying a good value, buying, don't just buy strictly on price, on the lowest, most affordable place, neighborhood that you can buy it may honestly be a, a very quick learning lesson and, and a loss or even for you, a break even, which is good, uh, like a value, like actually a learning lesson that you have learned that you probably never, never do again. So what, what uh, I see is when th there's, a, there's a financial value and there is a experimental value, meaning you experience something to you, personal growth, that's a value and it's legitimately so. But sometimes you do that with the ex at the expense of your financial loss. That to us, it's a it's a tuition, but it's something that you probably wanna you know wanna avoid. avoid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but from a financial standpoint, what we had learned is, you you know, and, and and this and this philosophy has stayed with us since the start of Kakoli as well. Um, never buy something just because it's the hype just because everybody goes over there. Yeah. Don't buy something just because it's cheap. Mm -hmm. Don't buy something that's because it's big, you know, or just look really glamorous. Shinier. Yeah. Buy something that you know you can create, something that wasn't there before. And that's something is what other people look for, right? Because at the end of the day, when you buy something, in, in that example, you buy something easily affordable, and uh, but not in a good neighborhood, and it was a lot of headache. It was really hard to offload, because then yeah. that means other people will have to do exact same thing as what you have done now at a higher price. So it's it's hard to get buyers, and you want that buyers to get to get the trouble off of your hand. So it's easy to buy than easy than than to sell. So that lesson, you know, we've learned that. So when we look out to buy something, since the start of Kakoli is. We look for solid assets that today we will be paying for a market, but we know we can drive up the value, the inherent, the, the, what they call it, the forced appreciation. Yeah. Now, I'm not planning to speculate the price of the value of, of the building, but because the beauty of the multifamily or this commercial 
properties is that it's based on the strength of the building. So whether the cap rate goes up or down uh, or maintain where it was, as long as my building still performing strong and better each and every year, I know I'm, my value is higher. Of the, the building is value is higher. So that's more a very, it's, it's, a, it's a down to earth type of approach that where it won't get, it, it's solid. And, and partly because, you know, we've got burned and I am being, I'm bringing back all my accountants risk, you know, risk prevention type of mentality into my underwriting and into just monitoring, managing these assets. If I see the assets is going a little sideways, bring it back. Like, don't wait until, you know, never let emotion get into your business plan and also your, the way you operate. Bring it back, tackle the problem head on. And yeah. believe it or not, sometimes he doesn't, like, you know, I talk to him, yep. like, what's happening with the building? Why is it this? And then he just kind of, you know, bring it back. Because I mean, when you're so focused on doing something, you, you kind of lose sight of the whole picture. And that's where I come in. Well, I'm just wondering, like, you know, in the spirit of, of this particular video discussing how things have changed, like, how have so these are fundamentals right what you guys are talking about is let's stick to the fundamentals the building has to have value add opportunities it needs to perform you shouldn't be buying based on speculation or emotion how do you guys see that playing out in 2022 for example where let's just say you know in most markets in ontario at the very least the markets i look at there's been a significant amount of appreciation um I don't know that the rents have gone up that much, but I certainly can see purchase prices uh, climbing quite a bit. And so if purchase prices continue to rise and, uh, and, and these current market conditions, maybe there's issues with employment based on certain mandates and stuff that have been going on recently. Like, where do, how do you guys create the right battle plan to enter the market at this period? Like when you guys are buying, I, I'm assuming you're buying, maybe that's a better question. Are you guys buying in 2022? And if so, what's your plan to address some of these, some of these just challenges, right? I mean, how are you finding properties where you can add value? That question we asked ourselves about three, four years ago. Actually, we don't ask about today. And three, four years ago, we were thinking, how are we going to grow? And we're looking at um, the entry point for the type of assets that we want. It's getting higher and higher. And the rent, as you said, does not catch up. You're paying a premium. And I just can't see that to be sustainable going forward. And here we are, 2022, it's getting worse and worse. And there, because of COVID, there's a lot more uh, players in in that were not players, now they're players in the multifamily. And that, you know, that is incredibly difficult. Even the supply is very, very tight. Anytime when you have a decent portfolio coming out, you have a solid, sometimes as, as many as five or six bidders. We talk about multi-million dollars, like we're talking about several hundred million dollars. Like that's insane, right? You think about the, the, the size of the portfolio, but we are talking about five or six <coughs> bidders. At the end, um, we stick with what we know. Because three, four years ago, we thought about this is going to continue on. We had started exploring how do we create our own supplies? We didn't think, um, we were thinking, okay, create, that means development. That means where are we going to develop and all of that. Who are we going to develop um, for us? How are we going to participate in all of that? So um, about two years ago, we were able to um, get to know our development management partner. We were able to kind of, you know, get our, get our feet wet with one project here. We're also looking for projects that like existing multifamily, but has excess land that we can develop. So all of these uh, little subtle actions or steps we took two years, two, three years ago, now is paying dividend. And especially when the COVID hit, we realized instead of focusing on just about creating product, we have to look at how, what type of product we're creating. Is it just regular rental or is it something affordable housing, right? Affordable units with the introduction of all these government grants and, and uh, the, the demand is there. The demand is getting stronger and stronger. 
And so today we have a few projects and our REIT is dedicated to affordable housing market, market and affordable, it's a mix. It's not just purely affordable, it's a market and affordable uh, rental properties in our, in our portfolio. What, what that also means is that that's our distinguishing, that's our distinction from all the other, or, or all the other peers. Uh, just a, a couple, I think we just recently read Equiton, right? Bought 75% stake in, uh, in a four building, four tower um, in, Ottawa. in Ottawa, four tower development project for high end rentals. And there's like many, many, you know, our uh, uh, bigger firms are pairing up with developers to get in, get into development projects so that one day they can buy those, you know, develop, the developers stake out and then they can hold these properties long term. But most of the time, these projects are for higher end rentals, luxury land rentals. So what that's what we are focusing on is the segment that is def in a desperate need, but not a whole lot of not, not a lot of, not a whole lot of people knowing how to tackle. And is in in, in supply wise, the government is forcing if developers to su to supply a minimum twenty percent or uh, twenty or twenty five percent of what they what they develop to be affordable units. So in a way, we, we didn't know we were gonna go into affordable housing, but the opportunity kind of presents itself, but that opportunity is because of our preparation ahead of time, finding where we're gonna focus on, how we're gonna get it done, who are the partners that we're gonna go with, and, and, and how we're gonna market going forward. Um, so that's what we see going forward in 2020, 2022 and beyond is the affordable housing is going to be a lot more, a, a lot more talked about and a lot more needed. The immigration is still 400,000 um, yeah. know, people <clears throat> immigrating to Canada. So where are they going to hit? One, one thing I'm interested here, Casey, and this is something you said to me in 2019, actually, the end of 2019. You, you said to me, it was off camera, so we can't flash it on the screen, unfortunately, but you gave me two pieces of advice, which I've really held close to me, which was, um, you said, buy better buildings and hold more cash, right? And uh, it's the buy better build, first of all, is that still true today? Uh, but the buy better buildings part, you know, do you think that remains relevant if, so if we're saying affordable housing is important or affordable options for people as our tenants to have, right? Are, do you think it's still as relevant today to buy better buildings or are you guys seeing that you're actually buying um, assets or inventory that's potentially in slightly less great neighborhoods? So like, no. are you shifting your focus from A's to B's to C's or are you just providing more inventory in good neighborhoods? When people talk, think about affordable housing, the first thing that comes to mind is street kids or yeah. homeless people sure. or, right? However, what the affordable housing definition really means is that affordable rent with, uh, uh, pegged at the household, average household income in the neighborhood. So we're very much, it, it, gone are the days when you think af affordable, like low income needs affordable housing. We're talking about a solid two income earner yeah. family that needs, instead of paying $3,000, $3,500 a month on rent, you, they can afford paying $2,500 yeah. a month. But they're still a good tenant in terms of tenant oh, yeah. quality. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So let's say Worley Village in London is a nice little yeah. possible neighborhood. Yeah. We're going to be building a building, let's say on Rideout Street or something like that, yeah. that we purchased that building. We're building affordable housing and within that that location uh let's say it's uh 80 percent of that dual income family family dual income in that in that neighborhood so 80 percent of let's say 150,000 is it's a lot yes yeah, a lot but it's affordable are, are you guys generally speaking are we building smaller units or are we just changing the finishes like how are we making yeah. affordable inventory so we're not talking about the uh, luxury rentals. Sure. We still stick to our roots, which is yep. functional, nice, 
long, uh, with longevity. The building is built very solid uh, material, like we, because we're totally for long, long term. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't sacrifice on quality, but we also do not offer a swimming pool, for example, sure. or a rooftop uh, luxury patio. patio. Yeah. Like we're not talking about, we don't, we're not offering that either. But everything has to be very en environmentally built. Um, and also address the affordable housing needs, you know, and, and we collaborate with, with a nonprofit organization if, in, if we need to. It's, it's a way for us to balance the profit and the social purpose in what we're doing. And too many times, I think traditionally speaking, real estate investment company uh, in, the, in the general sense are all about profit driven. Yeah. Right now, there's a push, and I think rightfully so. And for us, I think we should really start thinking about in along that line is how can we take maybe look, look at a profit, taking a profit in a longer term rather than immediately, and then only benefit us. We got to look at long term and benefit every stakeholder, including investors, our um, uh, the community, um, and and the environment as well. So. What that means is we incorporate all of that into our fund. We need to make sure that what we're doing ties, you know, really satisfy the environmental issues in our building um, and the social purpose in the way we make up our asset, the, our asset composition and the way we handle things uh, like property management and the way we, we run our business and the corporate governance as well. So um, it's, it's a definitely, I would say a shift in the mentality, how we look at real estate, not just about profit, profit, profit. Um, it's about, you know, profit is one thing, but just, just be impactful. Wow, guys, that is a really great way to wrap up this video. I'm just gonna share some of my main takeaways here for the audience. Uh, really appreciate you guys coming on. Uh, that, that was a spectacular journey sort of through how you guys started and what the market conditions were like at that time compared to where they're at today. And really what I understand about how your investment strategy has changed is you, you've really, you've taken a more long-term approach in that you've solidified your goals in terms of what it is you want to get great at, specialized in those things with a focus on performance, upside, value, and also stakeholder management. And I think it was important to walk through sort of what that means. Like you can be a specialist, but in doing so, uh, to borrow a line from Jocko Willink, discipline equals freedom, right? The more you specialize in an asset class, the more freedom you have to experiment with it. And that's where I think we saw your flexibility coming through, right? In terms of making condos or uh, changing your focus into some more affordable units. And I like uh, a word you just said there right at the end, which is stakeholder, right? Stakeholder management and making sure that everybody's benefiting. And the way to do that, it sounds like you guys have been able to follow you know, Casey's 2019 advice to me in, in buy better buildings, hold more cash. You've been able to do that by just really standardizing your product and getting great at your process so that you can still build great buildings in good neighborhoods uh, without sac So you don't need to sacrifice your tenant profile. You don't need to sacrifice your neighborhood or, or the quality of the actual asset. You can still do these things, but by, by standardizing and by having a strong focus on what it is that you're going to get great at. So I think those are some really great takeaways. Uh, those things are fundamental and bulletproof no matter what the economy is. And I think that those are the types of discussions that need to be had, right? There, there's a lot of hype around purchase price right now, or, or maybe low interest rates is the cool thing today or whatever it is, right? There, there's always a buzzword. There's, there's always something going on in the news or in the media or in the market itself. And uh, I think it's exciting for us to just talk about how fun it is to be boring, right? Specialize, focus on what it is that you're good at and standardization so that you can offer a great product uh, to a wider segment of people without sacrificing quality. So I uh, really yeah. appreciate you guys coming on. Uh, that's uh, Casey Wong and Jed from the Kikoli Group. So I really hope you guys enjoyed this interview today in this video and you'll come back to the real estate Canadian real estate channel to see more videos from us. I know we're actually about to shoot a video kind of breaking down their portfolio and some of the strategies that they've used to acquire these buildings and where those assets are at today. So I know you guys want to see that. And if you haven't watched the previous video from Casey and Jed, go back and watch that where I actually asked 
Jed, a bunch of questions about refinancing and how that might look a little bit differently in 2022 compared to the past as well. We get into a little bit of CMHC and talk about the different financing um, strategies that we want to focus on in order to get great refinances. So you guys want to hear about that. You want to hear about how these guys did a $20 million refi. Go back and watch that previous video. So until then, thank you guys so much for tuning in. This is the Canadian Real Estate Channel. I'm Adam J.D. Martin, and we had Casey and Jed from the Kikoli Group on today. We'll see you guys back soon. Thank you. Thanks, guys.